And we are live. This is Len on the Matthew 419 channel. I am joined tonight by my good friend Jason Peterson. I wanted him because, uh, well, let's just face it, he's a whole lot smarter than I am. But this, what we wanted to discuss tonight is Dr. Michael Jones of the New Covenant Group and specifically a video uh, that he put up. It was originally made by Christopher Hitchslap and mirrored onto his channel. I had initially gone to watch the whole thing because I, I was going to review the one on the Christopher Hitch Slap channel and I thought, well, I don't want to take anything out of context here. Um, so I didn't want to take anything out of context, so I went and watched the, the full conversation. But then I saw that he had mirrored the Christopher Hitch Slap video to his own channel, to the New Covenant Group channel. So clearly he doesn't feel that that video misrepresents his position in any way. So we are going to play that video tonight. We're going to talk about it. And we're going to kind of talk about why it is we have some concerns with Dr. Jones and the New Covenant Group. So how are you doing, Mr. Peterson? Well, uh, concerns would be an understatement for me. <laughs> I'm just speaking for myself. <laughs> okay. Well, shall we dive right into the video? Sure. Okay. I am going to switch to share screens here so that we can watch his video. Let me unplug my earbuds here. Can you still hear me, Jason? Yeah, I can still hear you. Okay, I'm going to turn up my speakers, and here we go. Okay, so New Covenant Group, Atheists and Theists Together. This is just kind of the, the start of the video. Um, what's the difference between a Christian and a theist, Jason? Um, everything. <laughs> we, uh, we'll get into that at the end of the video. Well, not everything, but there's a lot of differences. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, uh, and you know, um, apparently Dr. Jones didn't read Colossians 2. Wait, but we'll get to that later. Right on, right on. Uh, by the way, just for everyone's, uh, just so everybody knows, um, I was in the comment feed this morning on The Place, and Joey Livingston uh, contacted me on Skype, invited me on. I wasn't in a position to come on, but I told him he would be welcome to come and talk to me either on my channel or on the Bible Thumping Wingnut Show. I think I said on the Bible Thumping Wingnut Show. Seems that Dr. Jones was not interested in that, so, and I think he's got his own show still running right now. So the invitation was extended and it was declined. I don't know. Um, I didn't give a time to uh, this uh, Mr. Livingston fellow. So um, nonetheless, the invitation was given and declined. So with that, we're going to dig right into the video. I get so much email bashing me for being ever so inclusive. I love atheists. I'm not wanting atheists to come our way simply to come my way so that I can give them an ear. They deserve to speak. They deserve to be listened to. They deserve my love. They deserve my protection. They deserve my support. They deserve everything that I can give them in a wonderful context. And so my wife and I are very, very confident and sold on the idea of love being unconditional acceptance being unconditional when you're facing a person who has a daughter or possibly a son a loved one who is suffering so much and you can actually help them here you are you're the physician and you can help them and your disciples are claiming yours only sent to the lost sheep of the house of israel let's not take care of anyone outside of the context of israel how can you be so insensitive to those who are in pain how can you be so and those who are construed to be outside of the household of Israel. I'm asking for someone to be intellectually honest. I don't care what the rest of the Bible says. Put the book down for a moment and start thinking for yourself. Take, I mean, own your own responsibility. Ask yourself, just say, self, is it right for a parent to crush any child? Is that, is that good? 
some people would argue, well, you're not understanding the significance of this theologically. I beg to differ. If you want to debate theologically, just give me a call. I'll give it to you. I don't believe that you're a Christian from the things that you've said today. So you're not going to say, you're not going to shake my hand. I will, I, I will. I will, but I want to get my peace out first. See, the church says, we deserve this kind of punishment. I deserve to be beaten beyond recognition. I deserve to be pierced. If I'm sick, someone needs to die. I mean, come on. I'm simply asking you to be intellectually honest. I can't get people to be scripturally honest because if I say, hey, the Greek and the Hebrew really doesn't suggest X, Y, or Z, they're going to argue with me because they love their English versions. So let's talk about your theology for a while. You well, can't give it to me. Because I don't understand what you're saying. You don't and have the only problem, problem I'm is. saying, and you're trying to tell me about some problem. spurious idea that they inserted hell, and God's going to burn people and for eternity. Anyone who spins the idea of repentance is illiterate. Very illiterate. Is that clear enough? It's very clear, sir. Very clear. Just because an ancient said, this is what God said, doesn't mean that God said any of it. Think for yourself. Get outside of that box of saying, oh, the ancients heard from God, but God is not willing to talk to me, but he's willing to talk to the ancients. God's willing to talk to the ancients, but he's not willing to talk to you. Something's upside down with that mindset. Because Christians are afraid of truth. Christians are afraid to be honest about the ills of killing someone and calling it good. Every year I have to be sickened by so many people or who are claiming, oh, it's great to have this torture. Simple. In my face, reminding me year after year after year how cruel we were. If we are following Yahweh, I don't blame people for walking away. I'm going to give them an applause. Walk away from Yahweh. He's not worth serving. He's not worth worshiping. In fact, his morals are corrupt. Walk away. Love doesn't create distance. But the church does. I keep encouraging people to leave church because it creates distance. When is it ever right to beat someone beyond recognition? And boy, did I get a lesson. I heard all kinds of reasons why we should be beating people beyond recognition. It, it was amazing. I heard people actually defending the doctrine of beating someone beyond recognition. And I said, this is 2013. What's happening to religious people? Why are people getting so intoxicated with religion that they can't see that this is immoral? And it was Aaron Coven, by the way. He said, what motivates you to do good? I said, that's simple. That's so simple. Hell doesn't motivate me to, to do good. We were talking about whether hell existed or not. I said, it doesn't. I said, what motivates me to love my, what motivates me to do good to my wife? It's called love. What motivates me to be faithful to her? It's called love. It's that simple. It's not complex. This is the university that we all need to attend. Once you start realizing what love is, kindness is, patience is, you're going to find that you can say no with me to the crucifixion. All right. Give me just a second to unscreen share here and we'll dive right in. All right, Jason, where would you like to start? Hmm. Well, I watched the um, a lot of the longer video as well. That was a short summary of a, of a longer video that was about 50 minutes long. Um, first, I, I made some general observations when I, I had watched the video. The first one is, is that a lot of his defense for his, his interpretation of what the truth is, is, it consists of a lot of conjectural philosophy and not really any scripture. Not one time in his video from what I saw did he ever appeal to scripture. And it's interesting because this gentleman, uh, Dr. Jones, always brags about knowing Greek. But my question is, is that if you don't accept the premise of Scripture, then what good is knowing Greek? Because it would seem to me that he sort of wasted his time. 
maybe he should have studied philosophy or something. Um, so that that was one observation I, I I made generally. Another one is is that um, he was he he uh, showed a video of him talking to Psy. After saying, you know, if I show what the if I show you what the Bible really says, you're not, you know, basically appealing to you're not going to be scripturally honest. However, um, when and he showed Psy saying, well, I don't understand what you're saying. It's as if maybe it may, it kind of would paint the picture for me if I wasn't watching the video. To that, um, that he was trying to explain scripture to Sai and Sai didn't understand it. That's actually not what happened. If you watch the whole video, uh, Dr. Jones appears to be a postmodernist, and a postmodernist is someone who who um, relies heavily on intadexical context. And what intadexical means is that you have um, a state, you have a certain state of affairs, and any state of the any state of affairs text that you refer to, you know, any word you refer to, maybe may have different meanings in those contexts. Um, so, basically, um, he's, an, he's a postmodernist, and a postmodernist will hold that ultimately text has no objective meaning. And from that, I don't see how he would be able to in interpret scripture in, on any level if he was a postmodernist because text would not have any objective meaning in the first place. It's just self-defeating. Um, but, but basically, though, Sai was confused because whenever he was asking for intellectual context, uh, Sai did not know what that meant because Sai is not a philosopher. You know, he's a he's a he's a you know he's a street preacher and he's and he's an, an apologist that came out of a secular job. I mean, he's not a philosopher. You know, he's just someone who wants to go out there and do the work of God. Um, so uh, so really, um, that was sort of misleading, I think, because a lot of people might think that he was trying to explain scripture to Sai whenever um, whenever Doctor Jones in that clip. Never explained anything about scripture to Sai. All he did was make blanket assertions, saying that hell doesn't exist. But he didn't give any scriptural reasons for that. He didn't appeal to the Greek or Hebrew even once in their conversation. Um, so, I, so that's another thing I saw that that had jumped out at me. Um, but before I, I start lay, going into some of the of what he actually said in the video, do you have anything you want to say, Lynn? Well, <clears throat> I find the whole thing to be very insulting for. A person, the, the tone of the entire thing, and by the way, the, the tone of that entire video, that 50-minute video, he, he, he says he wants to build bridges between theists and atheists. And apparently you and I would be in that camp somewhere. And he says that if you, uh, you know, if you talk about repentance, you're illiterate. And he, he looks at Sai and he says, is that clear enough for you? So is that building bridges? You know, I think uh, I think someone needs to uh, remove the log from his eye before he starts to beat down Christians for their beliefs. I think he needs to take a really good hard look internally and see, like, okay, if if you believe with all your heart that that guys like you and I, Jason, are wrong, how are you helping me? How are you advancing the narrative with this kind of a tone? Right. And that's a good point. I actually didn't think of that, but that, that's exactly right. Because how? Because um, why are you building bridges with only atheists and not other people in, who are trying to follow the faith that are in that are wrong? Because it seems to me if you're willing to go out there and reach out to people who don't believe in God, you know, people have misunderstandings about Scripture, and you ha and you have this this um, this I know what the Bible really means mentality. I would think you'd want to try and share that with people. And not try and talk down to him all the time, because he certainly never talks down to atheists the way he talks down to Christians who claim the exclusivity of the gospel. No, never. He he never does. The only uh, if if you go on his show as a Christian, you will be embraced and applauded if you uh, water down your message. If you um, you know if if you uh, say something like, "Well, you know, I could be completely wrong about my faith," you'll get the oh. Oh, that's so wonderful. Oh, but if you go in there and say, listen, what you, you're preaching is heresy, which, by the way, he admits. He admitted it twice today on both showings of the place, on the morning and the evening. He admitted he's a heretic. He knows he's outside of orthodoxy with his teachings. Um, so that's not an accusation on my part. It's something he, he readily admits. And I want to revisit one of my observations that spin on it a little bit about how um, if you if this is this is what I don't get about him. Whenever he claim, whenever he just just revels in the fact that he's fluent in Greek, 
which to me I would say, well, congratulations, you're able to interpret scripture incorrectly using the original language. <laughs> you know, um, it's it's interesting because he says he can tell us what the Bible really says, but if he doesn't believe in the Bible, that seems to be irrelevant. Right. It does. And here's the thing. Um, look, I'm not a Greek scholar. I understand a little bit of, uh, and when I say a little bit, I mean like super very much at the surface. But here's what I know about Koine Greek. Koine Greek was the Greek of the people, of the common man of the first century. So it's pretty clear that God wanted the Bible. He wanted his word in a language that was accessible to all. He didn't give it in some arist, you know, some language of aristocracy or or uh, to the hoi polloi, you know. He gave his word in the language of the common man. And now Dr. Jones comes and says, "You're in love with your English translation." You don't know what the Greek says. So what I'm supposed to do now as a Christian is throw away 2,000 years of Christian scholarship. 2,000 years of, 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 of Christian scholarship and accept his. Um, There's a problem with his appeal to authority because he seems to be the only Greek and Hebrew scholar. If, I don't know if he calls himself that, but he, he, he uh, loves, you know, just loves t telling people that he's fluent in those languages. Everybody disagrees with him. He's, yeah. a, he's the one guy that got it right. He's going to come tell us, well, the church got it wrong in the last 2,000 years. You know, they were he fluent in Hebrew and Greek, you know, and they're the ones who compose the English Bibles, mm -hmm. um, you know, for us to read. And when you look at the different translations, they, the, you know, the, the meaning of the text is the same. Right. So, um, you know, so... So he's going to try and appeal to his own authority, but there's a problem when you appeal to your own authority when everybody else disagrees with you. Yeah, absolutely. And there's no, and there's no philosophical nuances to take into consideration in the way that there's philosophical nuances we take into consideration in the creation versus evolution debate. There's no philosophical nuances here that, that make any sort of distinction about why, he, why he's justified in holding this, this crazy position, you know, about a book he apparently doesn't believe in, and he, you know... Um, you know, and he even says a walk away from Yahweh, and the difference, and even if he did believe, let's just say, let's just scream for the sake of argument that he believed what Scripture says, he just had a different interpretation based off the Greek. Even for the sake of argument, if we granted that, his gospel is total opposite of what the Bible actually teaches according to all the mainstream Greek scholars. It's completely different. How could they get that far off to say that that somehow all these Greek scholars in the church in the past 2,000 years who were fluent in Hebrew and Greek somehow missed the fact that the crucifixion was not actually the gospel? Right. It's, yeah, those fools. It is. It's, um, yeah, it's, and it's interesting that, you know, it seems like the, the crux of his, his programming that I've caught of it of late is... Um, greatly focused on presuppositional apologetics and doing Bible studies with atheists. He was leading a Bible study this morning going through Ephesians 1 and 2 and dabbling into chapters 3 and 4, and he was dipping into Romans 8 a little bit, and he's having um, atheists um, exegeting Scripture, and he's exegeting Scripture, and he takes these texts, you know Scripture, you know Ephesians, you know Romans 8, these are talking about the particularity of the atonement, and he's spinning it to some form of universal atonement. And it, basically what he's saying is, look, we're all God's children. We're all God's children. He completely somehow glossed over Ephesians 1-4, which says we become sons through adoption. We're not natural-born children of God. We are natural-born children of wrath, according to Scripture, but you become a son through adoption. So, um, there, and there was so much wrong with that, and, and here's what concerns me so much about it, is that there are people like myself who are on YouTube engaged in the atheist, theist, Christian debate, and who are reaching out to atheists, trying to demonstrate the absurdity of atheism so that they will realize their desperate need for salvation, as I did almost six years ago. 
And then you have someone like Michael Jones, who has some level of scholarship. I mean, let's face it, he's not a stupid person. He's well-spoken. He's very intelligent. Um, but he is here to systematically make atheists just comfortable in their skin, comfortable in their sin, worse. Uh, just, hey, you know what? There are no consequences for your behavior, and there is no accounting that's going to be done. So you know what? Do what thou wilt. For that's the whole of the law. That's basically the message he's preaching to these atheists. And I don't know why he needs the Bible to do it. Well, I mean, um, I think it's interesting that the atheists will listen to him because um, atheists don't believe in God, you know, according to their philosophy. You know, they don't, they don't accept the premise of Scripture. It's interesting to see atheists doing Bible studies with this gentleman um, whenever they don't believe what the Bible says. So um, I just I wonder what the motivation is for the atheists to participate in the Bible studies with them, and I can only think that they're doing this in support for him, so that he will keep causing division. You right. know, Christ said, "A house divided against itself cannot stand." That's right. So um, I think so. It's, it's possible that some of these people that hang out with him might think that he's a card. Yeah. And they say, "Hey, hey, let's encourage him and let him keep doing this, so that he can cause division in Christian circles." Right. Because because atheists are pretty much against all religion. At least these random atheists are. They want to extinguish theism, not just Christianity, but theism too. So it is you know, it doesn't make any sense that these hardcore atheists um, that you know would go over there and, and do a Bible study with them, you know, because obviously they don't. They're not really particularly. But they don't believe the Bible. Right. So. While we're on this, Jason. While we're on the. Theism versus Christianity, that was a question I kind of started the hangout with. Why don't we talk a little bit about what the differences are between a theist and a Christian? Okay. Um, do you mean a general theist? Just someone who believes in a God but basically doesn't adhere to a particular religion? Yeah, I think we should keep it general since um, I don't want to define, I don't want to straw man what Dr. Jones believes, so let's just you know, the the tagline on the start of his video was bringing theists and atheists together or, or something of that nature. So, so Except for us. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Um, so why don't, you, why don't you talk a little bit about it just in generalities? Okay. Um, theism is basically where you believe in a god, but it's not like any god. Um, it, whenever you're just talking about general theism by, you know, by itself, apart from any other religion, um, theists do not believe any particular god of any of any religion. They just believe there's a god, and a the and a theist will generally say that that this god was active in the creation of the universe, um, that he was active in the creation of life and of man. Um, there's another type of of a uh, of belief in a general god called deism, which basically is a god that isn't really involved in its own creation. It just kind of it just kind of started everything and just let everything go go the way it would go. Um, so a theist would, would say that their God is, is somehow involved in the universe, whereas a deist would, would say that their God really isn't actively involved in the universe. Um, in contrast, Christianity asserts that the God of the Bible exists, and we get the properties of this God from Scripture. Um, so, we have a, so we have a book that tells us about all these properties of Scripture, and we have a book that we can test uh, right. for consistency. You know, the Bible says to test everything. We can test scripture as well and see that it comports with reality and that it is internally consistent. Um, and then when, and um, we can see that scripture also teaches a correspondent theory of truth. Um, you know, there, there are propositions that lead to certain outcomes. Um, so the problem with theism is that theism itself is not ultimately testable. First off, someone could just, with a regular theistic God, you could just you could just when they're arguing with an atheist, they could pretty much add any conjectural property just for convenience against the atheist because they don't really know who this god is. You know, they just say that he was involved in the universe, but they don't really know how because there's nothing to tell them. Mm -hmm. um, whereas with a Christian god, we are bound by the properties of the Christian god in Scripture, and we can't go out and we as Christians we should not go outside of the properties given to God through Scripture. Um, so basically. Um, you can't really test a theistic God because you don't really know who he is or what his properties are. You can you can conjure you know these conjectures, um, and, or maybe argue for something like the Klom, 
cosmological argument or maybe a theological argument, but you can't really go further than that. Because even from that, you, you, wouldn't, you, know, you wouldn't be able to make like a moral argument or, or, or argument for purpose or anything like that with theism. So that's some, so overall, as a system, Christianity is superior to, to theism, not only because Christianity is testable, but also because Christianity passes the test. Right. Okay, thanks for clearing that up. So now that we have that on the record, why don't we get into some of the particulars of what Dr. Jones was talking about in his video. Let's, let's discuss, let's get into the meat and potatoes of some of the things specifically that caught your ear and where you see problems, contradictions, logical fallacies, etc. Okay. Um, the first thing he... I saw he said in the long video was that he said that he knows what really happened in the days of Jesus. But yet he uses the Bible as a reference, it seems, to what happened in those days. So um, I thought that was kind of strange because I want to know what his sources are. Um, he mentioned that the disciples were, were, um, were wicked, which I agree, they were wicked. Everybody is. Romans 3.10, not one is righteous, not even one. Um, but... He, but he said that the disciples ran away so they can't be trusted, which isn't what the Bible says. Um, and this is the Bible he's, he's trying to exegete out of. So I don't know how he says he can know what happened to the days of Jesus without appealing to the Bible as a reference. And yet he seems to reject the Scripture. Because recall, and I'll get to this later, but he rejects Yahweh. Right. Um, but he seems to embrace Jesus. We'll get to that later. But I, I want everybody to keep that in mind as we go through the rest of these. Um, do you have any comments on that? No, nope, no, nope. keep plugging along because so far I'm tracking with you and I, I, when I have something to add, I'll just pipe in. Okay. He also says love doesn't like distance. Love doesn't say we need to be separated. It finds a way to get closer. Then he makes this profound statement. He doesn't want atheists to come his way so he can teach them. He wants them to come uh, his way so he can listen to them. And then he mentions he gets emails bashing him for being in, being inclusive, rightfully so. Um, a couple of points I want to make against that. First off, the Bible that he's he's exegeting in Colossians chapter two verse eight says, "See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition." Um, and and whenever you and when you look at what um, Colossians two eight says, we're not supposed to be trying to cooperate with human tradition. Because human tradition is is inherently evil. You know, it does not conform to the mind of God. You know, we are we are a fallen creature, and and this and society and as you know, you know, um, he, the human heart is is you know is wicked. The Bible says it. The human heart is wicked. You know, and it doesn't just say it's wicked. It says it's desperately wicked. So I mean, his principle is going against what the Bible says in the first place. Um, you know, and he wants to be inclusive and tell atheists that they're not going to go to hell. Well, then why did Jesus Christ say, I am the narrow gate and the path of destruction is wide? If there's no hell, why would, there, why would we even be talking about destruction? Um, and I would also say, because he says that they deserve to be listened to, and they deserve... Can, can I just, b before you plug forward, because I, I don't want this to get lost in the conversation, but I want to bring the words of Christ into this whole idea of mm -hmm. inclusivism, versus exclusivism. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 10, 34, Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves a son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Clearly. Cle now, look. <clears throat> I think that's a bit of a straw man to say, like, oh, we just want to... Uh, we, we're not interested in having conversations with atheists. We just want to shut them up and teach them doctrine and, and try to get them saved. Well, you know, at the end of the day, we do want people to be saved. But you and I, both being of the Reformed faith, we understand that we don't really have a role in that. Our role is to 
talk about the Bible. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. So we're going to talk about Scripture, share the Gospel, and you know what? Let the Holy Spirit do with it what He will. But this idea, this straw man, like, we, you know, he's the only theist in the world, apparently, who cares about, or his brand of theists care about people. Christians, you know, you and uh, we, us born-again fundies, you know, we don't care about people. Yeah, and um, like like I said, I mean, when I when I was watching this video, I was just so I was just so appalled because his because his his view is just all over the map. <laughs> so yeah. I, I was watching, I was thinking, I don't even know where to start. I guess I'll start from the beginning. Um, but yeah, that is a, that is a good point though. And I also thought, uh, you know, when he said that um, that they deserve to be heard and they deserve to have their opinion taken into consideration. Well, that's not really what the Bible says. In fact, that we don't deserve anything. God doesn't owe us anything. Look at Romans chapter nine, particularly nine twenty one. Um, you know, whenever it talks about the potter, the potter and and the clay, you know, that what what does the potter owe the clay that was made for dishonorable use? Nothing. Nothing. You know, everything. You know, everything about that clay belongs to the potter. And in, in the same way, everything belongs to God. God doesn't owe us anything. He's the reason why we're here. Right. Um, also, uh, another, um, another thing, too, because he, he was appealing to love, saying we shouldn't, be to separ we shouldn't be separated. Obviously, God disagrees. Love is unconditional in the form of unconditional election. To support that, we could use 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, uh, that we're chosen according to his purpose, not by our works. In Ephesians 1, 4 that you brought up earlier, we were chosen before the foundations of the world. Um, we could also look at Malachi 1, 3, Romans chapter 9, verse 13. For Jacob I love, but Esau I hate it. You know, um, God doesn't love everybody with the, with the saving type of love that he loves Christians with. Right. Um, and just so some understand what we're saying here... Um, I assume, Lynn, that you're a compatibilist in, in, in as far as free will is concerned, right? That God basically works his will through the will of man. Right. Yeah, so so, um, so, I, I want to bring up a point here. Um, we don't reject free will. All right, now, if you, were, if, you give us, if you ask us if we believe in free will and you're talking about the kind of free will that goes, that, that happens, that, that goes against God's, God's plan, we don't believe in that kind of free will. We don't believe that we can deviate from God's plan. Right. But we do free. We do believe that man makes choices, and they can choose God or they can choose to reject Him within the constant within the confine of God's will and sovereignty. So, right. uh, so you know, we do make a choice to follow God, but we make that choice because the Holy Spirit draws us in. Right. I would I would agree with that wholeheartedly. You know the 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 idea of libertarian free will, um, and I don't want to. This is a bit of a rabbit trail and everything, so I don't want to go too far off on that. If anyone wants to look at my Grace Under Fire channel, I did a whole one hour video with Jude Three Defense on free will. You can go and see my position on that more accurately. So, right. So, um, but moving on, because I know I know not everyone who listens. To Listens um, agrees with unconditional election, and, and it's really just misunderstanding. It's really a, just a misunderstanding of what we believe. But anyway, right. um, I found this interesting as well. God never kept the record of our wrongs. God never divided us. Hmm. What Bible is he reading? Right. Um, you know, uh, we can go to Second Thessalonians two eleven. God sends, therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false. So God, so, so God sends people a delusion. Well, you know, so that you know He gives them up, you know, and it says in Romans chapter one, and then you also talked about what Jesus said earlier, which is, which of course was spot on. Um, so, so clearly, you know, and, and not even that. Go to Genesis chapter three, the fall of man. Are you going to tell me that God doesn't keep a record of our wrongs? He just arbitrarily just, just uh, you know, just um, allowed us to fall into evil. See, I, I just wonder if he'd really argue that, because then, because if God doesn't keep a record of our wrongs, then how do we explain the fall of man? 
we couldn't explain it if we were to take the, you know, what he said, and if we actually adopted what he said, we wouldn't be able to explain Genesis chapter 3 and why man fell. Clearly, we fell, God uh, placed a curse on us because of our sins. So certainly, God does pay attention to when we do things that are wrong. Right, and that's, you know, not only not only is the sinner judged, and, and is there a record kept of the sinner for their sins committed, um, but there's also the believer. There's a, a record kept of their works. You know, the Bema judgment, the, the, the you know, the, the two judgments that are going to be happening. So, of course, God is, is keeping track. You know, the, there's a, I can't remember where the, where the proverb is, but it says, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. I mean, so yeah, what Bible indeed is Dr. Jones reading? I see why atheists love him. Yeah. Because he's not going to bring them any conviction of sin. He's going to keep them nice and comfortable, and he's basically passing out water bottles on their way to hell. Yeah, they probably need it. Um, you know, but um, like I said, it, it's interesting. And and if this version, if this if this brand of of um, you know heresy becomes popular, which I don't think it will, but if it does, um, then you think about it. If there's really no consequence for our sins, how many people do you think are going to be actually engaged in studying the Word of God? None. Why would yeah. they? Yeah, I mean, they just stayed, you know, a lot of people are just going to be comfortable in it. Um, so, um, you know, because that's our nature. We're sinful creatures. Uh, and, you know, and, and I know a lot of people who, who um, or rather I've seen a lot of people who just do enough to get by even at work. I mean, it's just human nature. Humans are lazy, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, but even today, though, you know, we had this problem in the Christian church as well because once people... Um, you know, accept Christ, they think that's it, and they just go and live like, like they did before, uh, you know, and say, well, I'm saved, so yeah. I'm good, you know, so um, it happens even today. Uh, there's just, and, and, and as a result of these kind of attitudes, uh, people aren't, you know, um, people are not um, going out and witnessing in the same way that Jehovah's Witnesses um, do and the way the Mormons do. There's not a lot of Christians that are doing that. Because they just because they think they're safe and that's all they care about is that they are safe. So, um, but let's see what else did he say? Let me go down my list. I made a list of things that I was going to respond to. Okay. Uh, he encourages people to leave the church because it creates distance. For that, I respond with Hebrews chapter ten verse twenty five that says, "Don't forsake the gathering together as some are in a habit of doing." Um, so what? So he he wants and. And I don't understand how people who, who don't learn who don't really know Greek are gonna are really gonna um, you know get guidance on the Bible and everything with without uh, going to church. I mean, it just seems like a foolish thing to say. Um, can I can I point out something also in in Luke chapter four, just with regard to um, this whole idea of, of leaving the leaving the church? Um, Jesus was a churchgoer. Got news for you. Listen to this in, in Luke chapter 4, verse 16, because I know Dr. Jones claims, you know, reject Yahweh, but he, he claims to be a big fan of Jesus, which we, I'm sure you'll bring that up. But um, uh, Luke chapter 4, verse 16 says, So he, Jesus, capital H, came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. As his custom was, he went to the synagogue on Sabbath. Jesus was clearly a church-going man. So, you know, he, he claims to be a fan of Jesus, but again, he is teaching contrary to what Jesus taught. He's teaching contrary to what Scripture teaches. And listen to what we should do about this. You and I, as believers, have a responsibility with men like this, and it's laid out in Romans chapter 16, starting in the 17th verse. It says, Now I urge you, brethren... Mark those who cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine you have learned and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. Boy, that sounds 
kind of familiar, doesn't it? It's kind of sort of relevant to what we're talking about, actually. Yeah, it sounds very relevant. But I'm sure that he would say that, you know, we don't have the syntax or the diactical, whatever, you know, he would baptize his it's language. context. <laughs> yeah. We're just in love with our English translations. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm getting a little you know, snarky. Speaking English, I'm you know, but hey, um, yeah. this is another thing he said too. If you love someone who is hurting, you will help them. Put the book down and start thinking for yourself. What do you think of that? Well, uh, that's a huge straw man, because who says Christians don't love and help the hurting? Right. Um, hello, I've I do uh, or and I have done ministry to the homeless. Okay, I um. I serve people who are less fortunate inside and outside of my church walls, okay? Um, and I know many Christians who do far more of these kind of things than I do. Look, you know, my gift is evangelism and preaching, okay? That, uh, those are my spiritual gifts, and those are the things that the Lord would have me follow. Um, but, you know, there's a, the, the chapter about spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians that talks about how each part of the body is relevant and important. So there are those who are so gifted for service, for taking care of the least of these. Hello, I've read Matthew 25, okay? It talks about taking care of the least of these. And I follow that, okay? So that is a massive ridiculous straw man. The Christians are the adopting people. Nobody adopts more children in need than than Christians do. In my church, I can name you probably off the top of my head seven families who's, who've adopted in the last year and since I've been in that church at least two dozen. I mean we are the adopting people, the Christians. We, we go overseas, we build hospitals, we dig wells. We've been doing it a long time, and by golly, we're pretty stinking good at it. Right. Yeah, and um, I have some. Unless you're unless you're not done, I have some other. I have some thoughts on. No, um, you go. That's that's that my well. rant. Um, I go to I'll go to Romans chapter nine verse fifteen, which says, "I will have mercy on who I have mercy, and I'll have compassion on who I have compassion." Because when he's talking about that too, I think he's talking about God, the character of God, and his and his unconditional love. And clearly, there's some people, there are people that God doesn't have mercy on. Mm -hmm. and there's others that God has compassion on. Um, and it seems to me he he uh, you know and he, and he he insinuates that he doesn't really care that the Bible disagrees with them. And again, I'd bring up the point that what is the point of you bragging about knowing Greek? It seems irrelevant now, since that's what you use it for is to interpret the scriptures. Um, and he complains that the church says we deserve punishment. Well, the church doesn't say it. The Bible does. That's why the church says it. Right. Um, the Bible says we're not righteous. We can go to Romans 3.10 again. Um, and he appeals to the Greek and says that we love our English versions. You kind of covered that already. Um, you know, and, and like I said, I think he's, he seems to be the only Greek scholar that thinks that the Bible says we don't deserve punishment. Yeah. So, uh you know he's kind of he's kind of outnumbered. So like I said, he can't really appeal to his own authority when everybody else disagrees with him. It just doesn't sound quite right. Um, and then he, you know, and he's and I and like I just I said earlier, I think that him saying that the church is getting it wrong has been getting it wrong for two thousand years basically was insinuating. It just doesn't seem probable to me. Um, and then this is this is something I thought was really interesting because I think this gives him an epistemological issue. Just because an ancient said that God said something doesn't mean that God said it. Think for yourself. Now think about that and think about his exegesis of Scripture. How is it that he knows what part of Scripture to accept and what parts not to accept based he off doesn't. of that? He doesn't. Right. He can't possibly. So, I mean, if, if, what he, if he really is going to hold to that consistently, he ought to not exegete Scripture at all. Right. Um, and it's interesting because in all that video that I watched, I, I just haven't heard him appeal to any scripture at all. I mean, he keeps talking about how the Bible doesn't really say these things. I don't see him going into it. Whenever you watched him this morning, did, it look like he, did he actually go into any, any explanation at all about his interpretation of scripture? Uh, yeah, he, he read a lot of scripture, and they, they interpreted all of it completely wrong. I, I've, uh, you know, Joel Osteen was sitting back going, what are these guys talking about? Those, you know, Joel yeah. Osteen would call Dr. Jones a scripture twister. Right. You know, um, 
it, it was to me. I I don't know what her he he and the unconventional pastor on that chapter or on that channel over there. I think his name is Bob Greaves. You know, they talk a lot about hermeneutics, but they don't. I've never heard them give what their hermeneutical mechanism is. They just say, well. You know, we're scholars and uh, we're linguists and people don't know how to deal with linguists. Sure I do. I go to the Word of God. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and when you think about it too, I mean, you know what, the, their hermeneutic is whatever satisfies them. Right. That's that's it. You know, and like whenever, um, whenever uh, Dr. Jones was talking about Christians stoning, you know, thinking that, that killing people is good, and stoning people. Well, I mean, he's obviously appealing to some of the Old Testament laws, mm -hmm. which if he knew anything about covenant theology, or even dispensationalism, um, you know, whichever whichever hermeneutic someone's using, uh, none of those would say that, that those that those laws really apply to us today. Right, exactly. Would, you know, so, um, you know, because Jesus came and fulfilled the law, and, right. and that's, why, that's why we don't have to do those things anymore. So um, he's so, uh, and then of course I would raise again Romans chapter nine and ask him. So what, from what authority do you stand on to tell God that he that he shouldn't you know pour his wrath on people, mm -hmm. especially when he's the one who gave him life, you know it just doesn't make any sense. Um. So uh, anything you want to say about that? No man, press on. I'm with you a hundred percent. I've got nothing to add of value. So go ahead. Okay. So um, let me find my place here. Okay, so one last point, and let's just and let's just reiterate what he said again. He said that just because an ancient said that God said something doesn't mean that God said it. Think for yourself. And uh, so it seems to me that Doctor Jones is leaning on his own understanding while trying to say he knows what the Bible really says. You know, um, he says I would like, and I said I, and I think I'd like to see him exegete Proverbs chapter three verse five, which says. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. Um, That's just then, you being in love with your English translation, dude. Oh, well, he can get over it. That's a you problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, um, it also, uh, he said this. This was very profound. I was very su surprised when he said this, and this just screams cold. If we were following Yahweh, I wouldn't blame him for them for leaving. He, so he's saying that he wouldn't blame people for leaving the, the church if we're if we're following Yahweh. Well, it's interesting because he, he said so many good things about Jesus Christ and calls him an amazing person. Um, and what did Jesus say? Jesus, Jesus said he came to do the will of the Father. We can see this in John chapter 6, verse 38, which says, uh, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Who sent him? Yahweh. So by that logic, he shouldn't like what Jesus did either. Um, and then he brought this up. He said, Eric Hoven asked him what motivates him to do good. Dr. Jones replied in summary, hell doesn't motivate me to like, you know, motivate me in the way that motivates other Christians. So he's basically insinuating that Christians do what they do because, they're, because they don't want to go to hell. Yeah, and he's saying that specifically about Eric, and, he, and I know Eric a little bit. You probably know him better than I do. There's no way that Eric Hoven believes, well, I better go do some good because hell's right around the corner. There's no way. Certainly not, because because that would entail justification by works, which is not something that Christianity accepts. Nope. So, um, so, and, and just to back up with Scripture, um, you know, we can go to Ephesians chapter two, verse eight. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing; it is a gift of God. So, um, the Bible doesn't teach that good works will get us to heaven. So, there's really even whenever you're saved. You know, if you're trying, there's no reason to try and do good works just so you can go to heaven. Because it's not our works that gets us to heaven. It's the gift of grace from God that we receive through faith. Right. Um, and he says love motivates him to do good. Um, I really don't have very many comments on that. Um, except for, I guess, I would need some incidental context of what he means by good. And love. Yeah, and love. I mean... Uh, and then he's and then he says uh, he claims we can you know and and you know he also claims that we can say no to the crucifixion, but he doesn't give any reason to say that for him for us to think that. Whenever the gospel, even from the Old Testament, refers to the sacrifice Jesus will make, look at what Job said. Um, you know he said, "I know my redeemer lives." Amen.
obviously referring to the re the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ that's forthcoming. Um, and you could you know and um, God made that promise to Adam and Eve after they fell. You know you will you will you will you know um, step on his head and he'll bruise your heel. That's a picture of of the of what God's going to do when He comes in the person of Jesus Christ and dies for us and rises again. People are waiting on this Messiah to come see Him. The whole Bible is centered on this act of love from God, where He comes right. down and dies for our sins. The whole I mean, if that if we don't have the crucifixion, the Bible's it won't make any sense because the Bible is centered around that event, the entire thing from Genesis to Revelation. Um, so, uh, and like I said, and this is the, I guess this is the final point I'm going to make about everything he said. When you only trust parts of scripture, your worldview reduces the skepticism. And that's because the way you choose what you believe and what not to believe is ultimately not testable in any fashion. Whereas we can test scripture as a whole. If we have scripture as a whole, we can test scripture for consistency. But if we can, but if we can pick and choose what to believe and what not to, you know, or what to accept and what not to, and what we should accept in scripture... There's no, there's no, um, there's no way to test it, because if you don't accept something, you just take it off. Right. There's, and there's no way to do it. I mean, you know, because now you're now you're dictating what's true, what's what's not, um, you know, from scripture. And there's no way to test that, because what if someone else looks at scripture that's about, about the essential doctrines, you know, and says, well, I don't think God's a Trinity, and another person looks at scripture and says, well, God's a Trinity. You know, mm -hmm. where do we? How do we resolve that? We don't have anything to go to to resolve it. We can only resolve those things if we just go ahead and read the Bible as a whole and to see what it means. Well, it's interesting because he had um, he had a pastor on his show tonight. I was watching it as I was setting up the hangout, just kind of listening, and he asked him about what his authority is. Calm down, hon. He asked about what his authority is, and and he asked him, is it is it is it the Bible or is it Christ in you? Like, what does that even? What What does that even mean? How do you know you even have Christ in you without the Bible? Yeah, because you because Romans chapter ten says faith comes by hearing and by hearing the word of God. So, um, but anyway, though I, it, you you just can't pick and choose scripture. If you do that with scripture, then then all of scripture it is it is you know reduces the skepticism. So I, I think that Dr. Jones, you know, and, and it's weird, too, because whatever he was talking to Cy and Eric, so I asked him what his ultimate authority is, and he says, I don't think, I, well, I can't say I have an ultimate authority. Would any Christians from, from Scripture say that? Would there be any Bible character that, that followed after God that would ever say anything like that? Do you think King David would say it? King Solomon? Um, you know, Job? Absolutely Abraham? not. I mean, you, you don't see that. That's not a Christian attitude. Dr. Jones is not a Christian. He's a false no. teacher. No, he's when when he defines himself as a heretic, he's doing it in a mocking fashion and in such a way that would mock guys like you and I, almost in in such a way to just throw it in my face. Like you know, as if I'm a heretic and what are you gonna do about it? Well all we can do is discuss it, you know. Um that's, Well the question is not what are we gonna do about it, it's what God's gonna do about it. That's right. That's and that, absolutely right. So, um you know, and I and I hope I hope that he comes to his senses, um, you know, and and I think it's sad that all these atheists are, are egging him on. Yeah, it's it's interesting. The atheists will love that brand of theism, won't they? Mm -hmm. Because because that brand of theism will never give you a word of truth, at least not in a saving sense, not in a, not the biblical definition of truth. Yeah, and he applauds atheists for for being atheist. Yeah. Why? Yeah. The script. Is there, I want to. I want to know if with his with his, with his extensive knowledge of Greek and Hebrew, if he can give me a Bible verse that supports him thinking that. Well, again, Scripture is not his ultimate authority, so. It's he, not, but he uses it, so yeah. I can ask him that question. Absolutely. So, <laughs> so here, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jason. If Scripture isn't his ultimate authority, then there's no reason for him to be exegeting it. He can just rely on himself, which wouldn't be very much different from what he's doing right now. Right. So, you you've pretty much said about the, what you what you want to say about the video, right? Yeah. Okay. So here's the hard question. The question that is on a lot of Christians' minds that uh, I've been talking to in the community, 
and uh, I will be interested to get your take on it. Do we have a cult in the making or already made down there in Pensacola, Florida? We have a cult, but I don't know that it's going to become big. He's been around for a while, I think. That not to say that, it, that it's impossible for it to become big, but I don't, I don't think that his brand of Christianity is going to get much traction. And by the way, I wanted to bring up a definition of cult because um, here's the thing: is we're not talking about a guy in his basement beheading chickens and sacrificing and things like that. That's not what we're talking about when we talk about cult. Here's the best the best definition that I found, and I think that this could be applied to Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, um, you know, Seventh-day Adventists, and things like that. Um, when we hear the word cult, I'm, I'm reading from an article on a website called gotquestions.org. Mm -hmm. It says, when we hear the word cult, we often think of a group that worships Satan, sacrifices animals, or takes part in evil, bizarre, and pagan rituals. However, in reality, most cults appear much more innocent. The specific Christian definition of a cult is a religious group that denies one or more of the fundamentals of biblical truth. In simpler terms, a cult is a group that teaches something that will cause a person to remain unsaved if he or she believes it. As distinct from a religion, a cult is a group that claims to be part of the religion yet denies the essential truths of that religion. A Christian cult is a group that denies one or more of the fundamental truths of Christianity while still claiming to be Christian, as Dr. Jones does. The two most common teachings of cults are that they deny Jesus was God and that salvation is by faith alone. A denial of the deity of Christ results in Jesus' death not being a sufficient payment for sins. A denial of salvation by faith alone results in salvation being achieved by our own works, something the Bible vehemently and consistently denies. The two most well-known examples of cults are Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons, and it kind of goes on to explain a little bit of those, so I don't need to read any further. But, you know, look, in that video, he talked about, um, you know, leaving the church, fleeing from Yahweh, and, you know, the, the how the crucifixion is not the gospel. I mean, that was the crux of that video from which those clips were taken that you and I just watched at the beginning of this hangout. So I would say by this definition that Dr. Michael Jones has a pretty good start at uh, getting a cult going down there in Pensacola. Right, yeah. Uh, they, but I, so I just, I don't really see it going far, but it's still, even if it, whether it goes far or not, it's still problematic. And, it, and people should be aware of, of these kind of things. Um, you know, and actually, this is kind of off topic, but I was in, I, I took my dog to the dog park today, and I ran into two Jehovah's Witnesses trying to convert a Christian family. Hmm. And obviously, I jumped in. I, I said, ah, no, wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> Let's argue this out, you know. Um, so uh, people need to be aware of this. And, and, you know, and don't just focus on atheists. Focus on... You gotta know your you gotta know your Bible, and you gotta and you gotta know theology so you can you can address these things. That's the best defense that you can have against cultish things. A lot of people focus on atheists and they don't focus on these kind of things that are happening, like with what Dr. Jones is doing. But cults are a very real thing, and they and they leave a lot of they lead a lot of people astray. So a lot of Christians that watch this show, you know, they probably primarily deal with atheists, but don't don't forget, you know, about the other religions out there. They're just as lost as the atheists are. That's right. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, and here's here's something else. I don't I don't think we've talked about this yet. Is that you know, isn't Doctor Jones' constant appeal to um, the original languages? You've got to know the Greek to really know the Bible. And I'm a linguist, and I really know the Greek, so I really know the Bible. Is, is this not some form of Gnosticism? You know, the, the Gnostics, the proto-Gnostics, they claim to have some secret knowledge about Christ, about the Bible, about uh, the Word of God and things like that. And, and how different is what Dr. Jones doing from what they were doing 2,000 years ago, you know, 18, 1,700 years ago. Right. Yeah, um, I'd, I'd, I'd venture out to say no no difference, really. Yeah. 
So, uh, but you know him. But it seems that all his expert and his his expertise in language seems to be irrelevant since he since he picks and chooses what parts of the Bible to believe anyway. It doesn't really matter what language he's fluent in, um, right. because there's no way for him to. I, because I would just I would simply ask him, how do you determine what's true in the Bible and what's not true if you don't accept the whole thing? You, and from the original like, Greek, you can't get those kind of answers. Right. You have to accept the whole thing, or your your worldview reduces the skepticism. Because once you once you decide that you can take out things you don't agree with, all of a sudden it's become subjective, and now everyone's entitled to their own interpretation of Scripture, and and now there's no and then now there's no real way to test anything against anybody because they can just people can just use whatever part of the Bible they want to use, right? Whichever, whichever way they want, and and you can't get you cannot you cannot get to um, you cannot resolve truth claims that way. Right, absolutely, and you, you know, cannot resolve truth claims if your if your whole pr approach is arbitrary. Yeah, and Scripture exhorts us over and over to test all things, hold fast to that which is good, to measure everything against Scripture. You know, the, uh, Acts 17 talks about the Bereans being more honorable because they tested everything that Paul said against the Scripture. Peter, who was on the Mount of Transfiguration, who saw Jesus in his glory, heard the voice of the Father. He, in his epistle, he said, yeah, I was there but we have a more sure word of prophecy. Right. And what is he talking about there? He's talking about the scripture. He said, don't take my word for it. Go to the word. And think about it. Let's, and I've and I talked to you about this before, I think off air, but think about it. If someone reveals something to you privately, like, like some spirit or something, just reveals something to you privately, um, and, say, and like some sort, of, some sort of ambiguous prediction, or perhaps, um, or perhaps they bring you a new book. Um, if Scripture is your ultimate authority, are you going? Are, are you really going to accept what that spirit brings to you? And let's say you did. Let's say that, that a spirit just communicates to you individually, and you have to go out and tell these people what you've heard. Um, how do you test that claim? It's not yeah. written. It's not written down. You know, years down the road, um, without a written account, you have nothing really to go off of. You have to trust, and with us, with the Bible, you have to trust a written account of Scripture or you don't trust it. But if the Bible's true, we should expect internal consistency within the Bible, and we should expect that it, that it's, that it would reflect reality, such as the realities of objective moral duties and, and truth and correspondence and propositional logic and the law of non-contradiction and the law of identity. You mm -hmm. know, all these, all these things that the Bible um, you know, either explicitly says or implicitly says. And yeah. you can't get those kind of things from from this just this arbitrary revelation. And some people will say, "Well, what about well? I mean, your your people that wrote your Bible, they got re private revelation from God. Yes, but there are others that got it too, and we can test their writings against each other for consistency. And That's we find right. consistency. That's so right. it's not so it's just not some person just just starting this whole shenanigan." Yeah. Well, we're we're over an hour now. Um, on this hangout, I, I think I want to wrap up with a thought um, because I'm just kind of thumbing through the comments a little bit, as it were. And someone someone left a comment and said, you know, since I've associated myself with the NCG two months ago, I opened my Bible more than I have in the four years that I was a Christian before I left Christianity. Well, let me let me go and represent this comment properly here. So. Um, I don't want to misquote anybody. So it says, um, it says, that's really ironic you should say that, apparently in us talking about the Bible. In the two months I've been hanging around the New Covenant group, I've picked up my Bible more times than in the previous four years since I left Christianity. Now, and here's the thing. Someone might say, uh, there might be Christians out there who say, look, they're doing Bible studies. They have atheists reading scripture. How can that possibly be a bad thing? How can it really be such a bad thing that atheists are are doing a Bible study with a man who claims to be a theist and they're exegeting scripture? Can't God use that to bring some of these atheists to true saving faith, Jason? Well, I mean, God, I mean, there have been people who have come out of cults before becoming a Christian. Um, Romans chapter 8 verse 28 says that all things work for the good of those who believe. Mm-hmm. So uh, I mean, you could say it's possible, but that's no reason to condone um, that kind of behavior from Dr. Jones. Think about it. What is you know you know um, people sin bring them the conviction of their own sin 
bring them to Christianity. But did that make the sin itself right? Certainly not. And as Christians, we shouldn't endorse sin just because some people, God may use it to lead some people to him. In the same token, we shouldn't endorse, endorse cults or um, be, for the same reasons um, because the, cause teaching anything contrary to Scripture is wrong. That's right. And so, so there's really, that's really. Go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, it's okay. Yeah, but there's, but so there's really. I mean, when you think, when you, when you think about that, it just such, such a, such an argument for, cult, for the existence of cults doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more because you know, really, that's pragmatism, and and you know, we're not, we're not called to that. We're not called to pragmatism. We're called to stand on the truths. Look, Romans sixteen seventeen has said it. You know to, you know, mark those who cause division and offenses contrary to that which you have learned. And, you know, at First John, and First John, John says to uh, his, uh, the readers of his letter, that those who hear us, who is he talking about us? Those who hear us are of us. So those who hear us, the apostles, the apostolic teaching, the apostolic message, which is repent, repent and believe. Now, I know that makes me illiterate to tell somebody to repent, but um, I'm sorry. If that makes me illiterate then uh, to obey God, then, you know, I guess I just have to embrace that with open arms. But as you were saying, you know, look, the, the Jehovah's Witnesses use Bibles. You know, the Seventh-day Adventists use Bibles. And you're right, people can come out of cults. People people can, but that doesn't mean we just sit back and watch it happen. We are to, look, Paul named names, Hymenaeus, Philetus, Alexander the coppersmith, etc. There, there are false teachers who are pointed out and put out uh, within, the, within the body of Scripture itself. So I think that it's important we have these kind of conversations. Yeah, and um, I guess uh, I was going to add one one other thing. I think I can't recall it though, but it was pretty important. <laughs> but I, I was going to add something else to complement that. What before you uh, were talking about Paul calling things out? What did you say before that? Because it gave me a thought. Do you remember? Um, about the hearing the apostolic teaching, or was that? I think it was after. Yeah, I can't. Well, okay. That's yeah, what I get uh, for rambling. Sorry. It, it's all good. <laughs> Yeah, but um, I, like I said, uh, Christians need to be aware of cults, and we need to be ready to address them. And the only way to address them is to get into your Bible. For anyone who um, is into apologetics, and they read apologetics books all the time, and they haven't read their Bible yet, I implore you, stop reading the apologetics material and pick up your Bible and read it. Well, right. The Word of God is the best apologetics book that you have. Well, the Word of God is like a lion. It really doesn't need a defense. Right. It can defend itself, and and whenever I debated, um, when I debated uh, Michael, you know, philosophical belogs, I think we saw that. Right. So, um, but anyway, though, um, that's on on uh, Dr. Jones. That's really all I have. But if he ever wants to talk, I'll be happy to talk to him. Not on his show because I've already seen how they don't really let Christians talk a lot whenever they teach the exclusivity of the gospel. But uh, if he ever wants to come on um, on a Google Hangout with us or something and talk, I'd be happy to talk to him. Um, but, oh, um, I was going to say one thing, Lynn. Whenever you say um, that you're illiterate because you uh, because you, you think that people should repent, I want to need some intodexical context <laughs> for what you mean by illiterate. So, you right. know, just, uh, his postmodernism, I mean, his postmodernism makes it impossible to interpret Scripture in the first place. So I'll just leave it at that. Well, I think with that, I, I think we've said what we wanted to say on this, and I think that this is a, a this is a, a group and a situation and an individual we're going to keep an eye on. Not because, look, this isn't an inquisition. This isn't some kind of a witch hunt against an individual. Um, I'm, you know, Dr. Jones. I'm sure he's a fine man. Um, he's clearly, um, you know, clearly people like him. And, and for good reason. But his teachings are dangerous, and they're going to drive people away from God. They're going to drive a wedge between a man and Christ. And someone might look at me and say, well, Len, you're a Calvinist. What difference does it make, you know? Right. <laughs> look, I'm just telling, I'm just doing what the scriptures tell me to do, because as a Christian, I walk in obedience to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So that's why I do this. 
Is this part of God's plan? Absolutely. We can't say that it's not because, as you said, Romans 8, 28, God is working all things together for the good for those who love God and are the called according to his purposes. So ultimately some greater good is being worked out in this. And look, this is the nature of heresy throughout the church. You know, most of the New Testament, I, I want to say off the top of my head, 20 books of the New Testament address heresy of some kind or false teaching of some kind. And God has always used false teaching to sharpen the church, to sharpen believers. So is that his purpose in this right now, is to get two guys like you and I together to share this? We've had as many as 27 or 28 viewers. We're at 22 right now. Um, look, I think that that could be the ultimate purpose in this. But look, Dr. Jones, whether you think I'm illiterate or not, Dr. Jones, I want to speak to you directly right now. You do need to repent. You, The crucifixion is not the sum total of the gospel. It's Jesus' uh, virgin birth, perfect life lived vicariously for those who would put their trust and faith in the De in the life, death, burial, and triumphant resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So I'm sorry that you're so offended by, the, by people wearing an instrument of death around their neck, but that is your only hope. That cross is your only hope. And I call you and anyone else who's part of that group, whether it's uh, even Christopher Mowdy, who I consider a friend, um, to repent and turn to Christ, to, you know, turn to the cross and live. You know, all ground is level at the foot of the cross. That is the beauty of the gospel. God is no respecter of persons. He doesn't care what your economic status is. He doesn't care what your past sin is, because no sin is so great that God cannot forgive it utterly, but no sin is so small that God will overlook it. And that's that's where I want to end. Do you have anything that you want to add, Jason? Yes, Doc, if Dr. James watches this, I live in Pensacola as well, so I live in the same city as he does. So if he ever wants to have a debate or discussion, I'll be happy to do so. Okay. That's so there's, there's the invitation, and as we saw in that video, he said anyone who wants to debate theology... He would do it. So I'm making some efforts with some people on a more scholarly level on my side of the th of things. And Jason, I, I think you've demonstrated you're more than capable of having a conversation with someone like Dr. Jones. So with that, we're going to sign off tonight. Thanks for, to the uh, to everybody who watched. Thanks for leaving comments. In the next few days, I'll be doing my best to respond to comments. And uh, hopefully, Jason will be here interacting as well. So thanks for watching, guys. And of course, uh, subscribe to this channel. We'll be doing more hangouts like this on topics like this and others in the days and weeks and months and years to come. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.